I'm Judy Gelman Myers with Jewish Broadcasting Services New Jewish Cinema and I'm here today with Ava Zelig, director and producer of this fabulous documentary An Unknown Country about Holocaust Jews who settled in Ecuador. When Hitler came, my childhood ended. On two fateful days in November 1938, a wave of violent anti-Jewish attacks swept through Nazi Germany, Austria, and parts of Czechoslovakia. What happened in, in Vienna was a pogrom, you know. You know what a pogrom is. It's a, a bloody persecution of Jews. This is my family, my grandparents, victims of the Holocaust, dead before I was born, like other relatives I never met. They took away everything you had, everything. I was frightened, everybody was. So my father said, time to go. This is the story of a community of exiles who found refuge in an unknown country, a distant land called Ecuador. People really did not know where the country was. What is Ecuador? It's tropical. There is a mountain called Timurazo and there are woods that are eucalyptus. That was all I knew about Ecuador. We had to open the frontiers, go into farming, to both the Amazonas, a subtropical rainforest. My father, who was a lawyer, was very concerned. For my parents, this was a very scary adventure. At first, uh, you suffer culture shock. So different from what we knew in Europe. The class differences in Ecuador, at least in those days, were tremendous. Hungry children, barefoot children, was a common sight in, at that time. At the beginning, everybody was sick. Everybody. There were diseases like malaria, typhoid fever, tuberculosis, hepatitis. These insects, the grillos, they coated the streets, millions of insects. And uh, not only that, uh, uh, every night we had to go around with a flashlight to um, ex exterminate the scorpions. All you're holding on to is your cultural heritage, your identity as a European, as a Jew, and suddenly you're in an environment which is about 180 degrees the opposite. The opportunities when first arriving in Ecuador were very limited economically. But what's amazing, within a few years, uh, they were able to really raise themselves up. Most of the European Jews who came to Ecuador did things which in Europe they didn't do, but they had to adjust to the local economy. There was a semi-European atmosphere among them. They created an environment that was compatible with their memories. We opened our suitcases and took out our culture that we had brought with us. And that worked for us. I often think of what they had to leave, the people they had to leave, the life they had to leave. How they came with nothing. the hardships they had. Grateful for the life they made for themselves, but still mourn the fact that, that they were displaced. That they were able to overcome that in a new culture, in a new world, learn the language, and uh, succeed. That, to me, is a great example of the human spirit really overcoming great tragedy. Ava, it's so wonderful having you with us today. Thank you. I'm very glad you invited me, and thanks for the compliment. <laughs> uh, um, I love the film. 
Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you come, came to make it? Sure. Um, I was born in Ecuador. And the reason I was born there is that my family, including my parents, had to escape uh, the Nazi persecution. They lived in what was then Czechoslovakia. And because if they hadn't escaped, we know what the consequences <laughs> would be. They'd be exterminated. So they managed somehow, I don't know the story, to obtain a visa to Ecuador, a country that nobody knew in Europe, practically in the world. It was under the radar. And so they, that's where they landed. And that's why I was born there. The, uh, I actually left the country uh, around the age of 17 because uh, many of the uh, children of the refugees and even the refugees were looking outward. Uh, for some reason, many of us didn't quite become true Ecuadorians. Mm. And so I was looking always to going away. I just knew I would. I don't know. And so eventually I became a TV and video producer uh, and basically always telling other people's stories. And I hadn't done my own documentary before. Always whatever programming that I was asked to do, I did for PBS or any other channels and other out outlets. But in this case, the reason I uh, did this film is that uh, one day, I don't know how I learned, that children of the refugees who uh, were born in Ecuador, as I did, and now lived abroad, were planning a reunion. This was about five years ago a reunion in Ecuador. And that piqued my curiosity. I hadn't mm. been there in eons, but I wanted to experience that reunion to see what would they see, how would they react, how would I react to returning to this place that in many ways for me was very sad because my family's story is sad. Yes, they found a survival, but they had to cope like so many of the others with a situation that was very difficult and especially difficult for my family for some strange reason, but it was. So I decided, then I learned also that there was a website that this gentleman, Ralph Grunwald, had created called Jews of Ecuador. He calls them Joes. Yeah. <laughs> we call ourselves Joes. And in this website, he created it so that the, these people who are no longer in Ecuador also were in Ecuador. Whoever had any relationship to the Jewish experience of Ecuador, uh, from the Holocaust on, uh, could uh, submit their uh, personal recollections, uh, memoirs, uh, photos, documents, to create uh, basically an archive of our uh, experience. Fantastic. Yeah, and so that's, uh, so then at that moment I started reading the website and I hadn't really been that uh, much a part of the Jewish community in Ecuador. Uh, I wasn't. I was more with Ecuadorians. And at that point, I began to read these amazing stories of survival, of perseverance. And I thought, this is fascinating. It hasn't been told. The story of the Philippine Jews has been told on video. The uh, story of Dominic the Jews who ended up in the Dominican Republic or in Cuba. Mm -hmm. Hey, Ecuador has a place in the world. I felt compelled to tell the story. And so five years ago, I set off on, the, on this reunion, took a cameraman with me, and started shooting. Wow, and, that's great. Yeah. What was it about Ecuador that was one of the very few countries that asked Jews to come in? I, I, I mean, there were... There were logistical reasons in terms of an industry and agriculture, but, but you also, in the film, hinted at something, mm -hmm. something uh, not spiritual, but something else about Ecuador in particular. Well, the people I interviewed felt very strong, uh, strongly about it, and so many of them, even a historian I interviewed who appears in the film, he says, this is something special. Many countries could have closed their doors, but no, Ecuador, kept their doors open, and it wasn't a country that could really uh, afford to bring uh, thousands of refugees. It was a tiny republic that was quite, at the time, underdeveloped. But what it is, is there are many factors that, uh, that came together to bring the Jews in. One of them was that uh, it, it w at the time of the beginning of the persecution of the Jews in Europe, Ecuador was actually in a fairly chaotic situation politically. During a period of about eight or ten years, there were something like ten presidents in office. Wow. And, but there were a couple of them who were kind of liberal. And they had a feeling that bringing Europeans could help the country. 
This was done by other Latin American countries, Dominican Republic, the Trujillo, the dictator. Yeah. He uh, wanted 100,000 Jews. He couldn't get them because the Jewish agencies couldn't work uh, so fast or had the money to send that many and things became chaotic in Europe too. But uh, they had this feeling that Jews, especially and Europeans, or Jews or not Jews, they could help the country become uh, uh, develop a middle class, and they could uh, develop the frontiers. They could do a lot of things uh, to develop the country. That was one idea. But they also were uh, uh, humanistic in their thinking, and uh, especially one of them, one of the presidents, felt that he had felt an obligation to, to save uh, them from the Holocaust. And so that, those were the various uh, um, reasonings that came together. But there was another thing. In Ecuador, the consuls that were located in Europe, the Ecuadorian consuls, had a big influence on who got a visa yeah. or not. Some of them were outright anti-Semitic and made it very difficult uh, for people who came seeking visas. Uh, part of the deal that the government had uh, set up for uh, uh, the refugees was that they could only work in agriculture or in an industry sanctioned by the government. So the Jews who arrived, uh, these are uh, uh, urban Jews, all of a sudden they never even had a trowel in their hand. <laughs> they arrive in Ecuador and they have to start working in agriculture, they have no choice. Some of them escaped the, the strictures of the law and traded, they did commerce. There was this ancient thought about Jews as com in commerce, yes. you know, there was still this, uh, yes. this anti-Semitic this anti uh, uh, approach that Jews shouldn't. They Also, many of the elite felt that they would uh, then take away the power from them. And the church had very old uh, traditional ideas about Jews also, which then were transmitted to, to the population. Uh, when I was growing up as a, as a child, I heard the word, uh, you know, you're a Christ killer. So many of us who were children of the refugees were not too happy to say we were Jewish. I always fudged. I said, well, I have no religion. Uh, I don't believe in anything. I couldn't say I'm Jewish. I was afraid. Yeah. And this was told to me by several of the people I interviewed. They were not too keen on admitting they were Jewish because they knew there might be a backlash. Of course, that could happen in the United States and did happen in the US as well, you right. know, except right. that there was this homogeneous country ruled by the Catholic Church. The uh, Protestant missionaries that eventually evangelism became very big in Latin America, that happened la in later years, but not in the late 30s. So those were the various factors that contributed to Ecuador opening its doors. You know, a country that felt that they could use Europeans to develop and open the frontiers. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so does it happen that about 3,500 to 4,000 uh, refugees showed up on the shores of this tiny republic. There was an unknown, unknown country. Yeah, you know, nobody knew. Um, there was the, the Aaron family um, homesteaded for ten years. Yeah. I, you got incredible um, archival images of yes. them. Yeah, their story is very moving. Uh, the person who tells the story is Gert Aaron. He was about almost twelve years old when uh, they set off from uh, Germany in 1939. The family came from Königsberg in Germany. Ecuador um, was able, the, the leaders said, oh, you want to develop the frontiers? You want to go to the Amazon jungle? <laughs> Fine, we'll give you land. Go ahead, we'll give you land. Whereas those who stuck to the central part of the country, to the highlands, of Ecuador, where many of them farmed as well, they had to buy their parcels of land. But because the jungle was very difficult and, and very difficult to even create a homestead there because of the conditions, they gave them land. So at least you were a step ahead, except what, wait, what awaited you there. That was another story. But what they did is they had to build their own house, which was made of local materials, such as palms, for palm trees. And then they, they had very bad experiences in the beginning. They got bad advice and got uh, 
cattle from the highlands. These cattle d would not survive in the lowlands of a subtropical rainforest, so they died. They were practically running out of money. Finally, local people uh, advised them, you've got to take this kind of cattle, and those cattle, the cattle did well, but they had to learn to milk them, to make cheese, to make butter. And they did well with the butter because butter wasn't known in Ecuador at the time. I think also they were able to sell in the town, to which they had to walk through the jungle for a half hour loaded with the backpacks of their merchandise as kids. They had to wake up at dawn to milk the cows. They were constantly working, working. It was a very hard life. But he said the nice part of it is you had freedom. As kids, they could go to the river. They could float on a piece of bamboo. They could uh, play, but their life was just work, work, work. Whenever they ran out of money, the mother started baking. Uh, they started even uh, making, um, she started weaving placemats, etc. And the weavings were also sent to Quito to uh, store the sold folkloric items. And, <laughs> and so the, he laughs about it because uh, Gert said, sure, the, these Americans thought they were buying. <laughs> right. a, you know, weavings of the indigenous peoples. <laughs> but these were uh, weavings that his mother, a German woman, did. She wasn't thinking of folkloric uh, <laughs> motifs. She was just trying to make a living. As it was very hard. And this was a continuous complaint of the refugees. We miss the culture, culture. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. was very important to them. And yeah. that's why I'm veering off the subject a little bit, but that's why they... Uh, created a cultural life in Ecuador. They were a very rich cultural life. They had theater, they had social occasions, they had all kinds of activities. But these activities always kept them together because to them it was going to the moon. It was 100 degrees the opposite of what they had experienced in Europe. So in many ways they did not adapt. They did adapt, but they didn't really go into the Ecuadorian society. Mm -hmm. In the jungle, there was no choice. There was a town nearby, and the kids were adopted by the townspeople. They were invited to their parties, so they participated. There was no one else there. They were in the jungle with yeah. a little town that now is a big town, not as attractive as it was then. But the story is basically the Jews in Ecuador created, recreated the, the, the memories of Europe in Ecuador. And uh, people didn't understand who these Jews were. They called everybody who was a foreigner a gringo. A gringo was usually applied to Americans, but they conflated everything. They were, everyone was a gringo. I was a gringo. I was born there. That's what I'm talking, uh, you know, that oh, they couldn't, uh, they, so they were two, they were worlds apart, and yet they were in the midst of an Ecuadorian uh, society. Yeah. It was a very odd uh, situation. There was an amazing moment in the film, it, it, just the most supreme irony, where the native, the indigenous population had been trained by the, um, the white conquistadors to step off the sidewalk as a sign of respect for any white people. And all of a sudden you have these Jews who had been hounded out of Germany, you know, conceiving of themselves at, well, I don't know if they conceived of themselves, but, but they were victims. They were, they were despised people. And suddenly you have these Indians stepping off the sidewalk as a sign of respect. Yes. I, I mean, what was the relationship between the Jews and the indigenous population? Well, that, in some cases, it, they, the Jews wanted to befriend these people, but there are very few cases like that. They were really didn't know what to make of this group of people. They were seeing uh, women, indigenous women, looking for lies in the head of their children, and then taking the lies. They would go like this and eat the lies. And this was a common sight. I remember that as a child. Well, what do you think of people like that? You know, you think, oh, they're primitive. They, they weren't primitive. They were, the Spaniards really had made them quasi-slaves. And many of the, the European Jews were appalled at their situation. I think many of the Europeans too felt superior. Sure, they were hounded and they came without a penny to Ecuador, many of them. But yet there was this thing, maybe being a German, they had adopted this, you know, they felt superior too. They, look, it's dirty, there's poverty, you know, they didn't see the conditions that they could have been in, and they were in before departing. Many of them were 
they had nothing. They, you know, they barely trying to escape, barely escaped, and yet soon the old uh, kind of the old mentality yeah, came back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not for all, you know. There were many people who came. They were very diverse, different backgrounds, mostly mostly urban. Some rural people from Romania. Some of them did know how to run a farm, but they all abhorred the attitude uh, of the elite. Uh, of, of the upper class, of the, high, uh, the way they treated the indigenous people. These complaints were overall, everyone hated that situation. They sometimes tried to convince the owners of these farms who were often uh, huge landholders, who were absentee landlords who lived sometimes in Madrid or in Paris, mm. convince them to please give them some slack. These people have nothing. They said, don't get involved. Don't get involved. We've been doing this for centuries. Of course, Ecuador today is different in that sense. You know, yeah. everyone uh, has uh, equal rights. But the inequalities at the time were tremendous. Yeah. What was it? It was an upper class and then a, a lot of poverty and, uh, and hunger. And they all talk about arriving to Ecuador um, in the uh, coastal region, they get to the main port city of Guayaquil. That was city was the, there was malaria there. There was typhoid fever, tuberculosis, all, uh, amebiasis, which are uh, these uh, parasites that invade your digestive system, and then you are uh, you have problems, uh, health problems for life. So they were exposed to a lot of uh, problems. There, is particularly during the rainy season, there's a swarm of crickets that arrives in the city, and the city is covered with a brown uh, rug. It's of, like a 10 plague. It is like a plague. <laughs> so you go around like this, getting rid of crickets that land everywhere on you. I kind of liked them, but they didn't. <laughs> I liked the crickets, they made a nice sound, but it was really an invasion. It was a swarm also. And so all these things freaked them out, you know, they were scared. I think they were better off when they went to the highlands. The climate was better, it was spring-like. The, country, the, the countryside was beautiful, the mountains, mm -hmm. the snow-capped volcanoes. And then there is Quito, the capital, where they arrived on this train that had been built, I think, by the British. Um, in fact, this wasn't the first time that Jews had arrived in Ecuador. Um, Many had arrived in the 17th century as Muranos. Um, I, I don't know if they revealed their Jewish identity or how many also Sephardic Jews came, um, you know, Spanish-speaking Jews from, from that exile. Right. So can you... Right. They did arrive with the conquistadores, but they kept to themselves. Some of them were heading to Lima, Peru. Then they heard that there was an inquisition in Lima. So they got sort of stuck in the southern part of Ecuador. And there, they, they, everybody knows about the Sephardic uh, Jews of, of this uh, southern area of Ecuador. But they didn't really openly practice their religion. And many weren't even sure. They knew that there were certain practices that their families indulged in. Or, uh, so they, they felt that they were Jews. Plus, their names were Sephardic. In a recent uh, showing of my film at the Ecuadorian Film Festival in New York, uh, many Ecuadorians approached me and said, you know, I'm a Sephardic Jew. My background, my name is Sephardic. I was, I was astounded by this revelation that there were so many people who wanted to be Jewish and who acknowledged this background. And because so many people are now sort of coming out, um, <laughs> there is a um, there are certain congregations now in Ecuador that cater to these people who want to convert to be really Jews as their background should have been. And now they're slowly. I think one congregation has something like 660. Wow. Uh, congregants, yes. So uh, it's interesting that there is this, <laughs> this turnaround of uh, when in the past they would never have acknowledged. Not when I was a kid there, nobody would have been happy to tell the world they were Jewish. It was just too dangerous. You yeah. know, the Catholic Church was very, very, a very strong influence. As I said, they they called us Christ killers. Right. They right. said, "We why don't you have a, 
a horns and a tail, right? like the devil, you know, that you are, you Jews. That, that was uh, prevalent. It was obviously based on ignorance, and today you're not going to hear the church uh, uh, say those things about right, Jews. But right. then it was very difficult for, for some of the refugees. So in terms of identity, how were the Jews able to adapt to life in Ecuador? Well, many adapted without problem. They were able to start uh, making connections with Ecuadorians. The majority didn't. They stayed in their little group. But for the children of the refugees, such as myself, you're bo I was born in the country. I should have felt Ecuadorian, but I didn't. And the people I interviewed for the film who had a similar background, I would ask them, so what are you? Are you Ecuadorian? Uh, what are you? Mm -hmm. Many had left, of course. And they invariably would say to me, I'm a citizen of the world. I don't feel Ecuadorian. I don't feel American. I don't feel whatever country they went to. And that's exactly how I, I always feel and always felt. I've even been here all these years. I still have this sense of displacement. And yet, I was born in that country. I was there till age 17. And everyone has the same feeling. Well, many of them, of course, were very attached to the country, had wonderful times there, and had great friends. We all had nice Ecuadorian friends. The Ecuadorians are very friendly and very, you know, they, they, they enjoy your company. They, they want to be friends. They wanted to be friends with the, with the foreigners in their midst. Sure. But they respected them because they thought, oh, anyone who comes from Europe should be respected. You know, they, they have more knowledge. You know, it was just this idea that that was the case. But uh, so this identity kind of what got diluted for us. Did anyone, Be did any of the people that you spoke with say, I'm Jewish? Oh, yes. They all, the majority acknowledged that they are Jewish. I mean, but did they say, you know, I'm not Ecuadorian, but I am Jewish? Did they, is that how they... Absolutely. Identify themselves. Absolutely identify mm. as Jews, no question about it. I and a few others as children were not so keen on telling people we were Jewish. We were afraid of a backlash yeah. somehow. Where that came from, I don't know, but it existed. But everyone acknowledges I'm a Jew, no question about it. It was just the other identity. Am I Ecuadorian? No, I don't think so. Am I American just because I live here? No, I'm a citizen of yeah. the world. And this is the result of this displacement. So we are people without a country in many ways, too. It's, it's an odd... Uh, Curious fact of uh, having been born in Ecuador and uh, grown up in an exile community. Yeah. I'm Judy Gelman Myers, and this has been New Jewish Cinema for Jewish Broadcasting Service. Ava Zelig, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. It was very interesting. <laughs>